two thieves develop a terrifying pattern, combining bank robberies with home invasions and taking families of bank executives hostage. For years, federal agents track them, always one step behind. Even when they're caught, the robbers do not quit. An ingenious escape sends the fugitives on another crime spree, with the FBI once again on their trail. Too often, convicted felons learn new techniques and find new partners in prison. In 1982, a group of former inmates began a spree of kidnapping and robbery. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For years, the suspects used false names and a network of criminal contacts to elude capture. To find them, the FBI had to pierce their tight-knit circle and find new partners of their own. On December 28, 1982, Oklahoma City Bank Vice President Steve Thompson and his wife Ellen arrived home from a holiday party. Unexpectedly, a car pulled in behind them. When they got out of the car and started entering our garage, they hollered, Mr. Thompson, we're federal agents. They were on top of us, you know, with just in a few seconds. Ellen Thompson thought perhaps the men had the wrong house. I couldn't think of any reason federal agents would be coming to our house, and I've heard of mistakes before, so uh, I looked at him and said, there must be some mistake here. Can I see your identification? And he pulls out a gun. The one with the obvious wig seemed to be the enforcer. The other one was in charge. There was obviously one other male involved because somebody drove him to our house, and that car left and we never saw that car again. The two gunmen forced the couple inside. The leader began interrogating Thompson about the bank where he worked. He cooperated so the incident could end without anyone getting hurt. Mm -hmm. No, Thompson answered know. some questions about the bank's complex security system, the doors, but he knew the safety of his employees came first. And you I didn't know. give him names of actual people that had combinations and stuff. I said, we'll just have to wait and see who gets there and who has the combinations and stuff, because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to put any individuals in jeopardy. I see. A man called to speak with a gunman. Yeah. Uh-huh. It sounded like they were okay. finalizing plans for a robbery the next day. Well, call me back at 6.30. The leader warned Thompson to follow his orders exactly. Okay. He was trying to make a point with me, and, and, and he said, uh, if anybody sets off the alarms tomorrow, if anything goes wrong and the police come, he said, I'm going to kill the police. Tell me. He made the comment at that point. He said, he said, I'm not going back to the penitentiary. The gunman held the couple hostage overnight. An hour before dawn, they forced the Thompsons to drive them to the bank. Woman? At 9 a.m., they waited for employees to arrive. She's wearing a black dress, floral print. They had someone stationed outside as a lookout. She's coming in the front door. During the robbery, one person was in contact with somebody by phone the whole time. And they were able to give him detail as far as how many people were coming to the front door. The gunman knew only certain employees had access to the multi-layered security system. We got our business this morning, but if everybody cooperates, we'll be okay. Ma'am, I need to know, do you have the combination to the safe? No. I need no. you to come with me. 
Those without codes or combinations were shoved into a bathroom holding area. What's going on? Blonde, tall. Act natural, everything will be fine. It always takes you know, more than one person to access anything. You have different layers of security within the vault and the cash vaults themselves within the vaults. Sir, I need to know, do you have the combination to the safe? It's okay. Yes, I do. I need you to come with me. Anyone with a code was put to work. So that's what he was trying to determine was who was going to be able to access that cash. Other employees had gotten them close. One final combination stood between the robbers and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Get it open. Don't play here. Don't be stupid. The robber with the wig was the more threatening one. Do what you're told, no one gets hurt. Good, now get in there and fill them up. Within 30 minutes, the gunman had hundreds of thousands of dollars in hand. Did you get it? Got it. Come on. I need your keys. They herded Mr. Thompson, the manager, in with the other hostages. He put me in one of the restrooms, and he told me and the people in our restroom that said, we're going to be here five more minutes. Nobody stick their head out. And they left, and I was pretty sure that, you know, from hearing the conversations out there, that they were going to leave right away. No, wait. So I probably waited, uh, you know, probably a minute and a half before I came out. Here the robbers had gone. Thompson directed the manager to contact authorities. Go ahead and call the police. Yes, uh, Quill Creek Bank's just been robbed. Uh, we need the police here right away. The call went out to nearby Oklahoma City patrol units. Following standard procedure, Oklahoma City police also contacted the FBI. Special Agent Mike Cycle took the call. I shouted to other agents uh, on the squad that uh, we had a bank robbery. I gave them the location and uh, gave them a, a little bit of information about what was going on, the fact that the robbers were gone, and uh, we had a bunch of agents in head for the bank. The patrol units arrived first. They approached quietly and cleared the bank, making sure no gunmen were still inside. FBI agents arrived minutes later. The Hobbs Act, enacted in 1946 to protect federally insured depositors, makes bank robberies the jurisdiction of the FBI. It meant a nationwide police force would investigate the crime and go after the robbers. The Thompsons described the ordeal that began in their home the night before. So no one was hurt. Didn't have anybody hurt. It had been a sophisticated, well-planned crime, with no evidence left behind. These robbers must have struck before. But no similar robberies had occurred in the area in the past. Agents searched the FBI's database to see if any had been committed elsewhere. They found a national file of robbery cases that included invasions of bank employees' homes. So I pulled that file out and found that there were several offices that had robberies where the pattern was very similar. So I started communicating with those offices. 
He hoped to find an agent who had experience with whoever robbed the Oklahoma City Bank and located Special Agent Steve Chenoweth at the Phoenix FBI. Hey, listen. Cycle described the Oklahoma City home invasion style bank robbery, the robbers' disguises and their mannerisms. How many guys? Chenoweth immediately named two bank robbers he knew, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty, yeah, as having operated that way. All those things are, are typical of what they had done in the past. And so a lot of that, uh, once I learned the actual details of what had occurred in Oklahoma City, just uh, pointed a finger right at those two. Witness descriptions from Oklahoma City matched the felons. Because of his knowledge of the pair, Chenoweth became the lead case agent. He knew that Connor and Doherty had met in federal prison. Terry Connor was the leader, in for three Arizona bank robberies. Each time, he and his partner had held bank employees hostage overnight. Joe Doherty was just a thug from uh, Philadelphia and uh, was a stick-up uh, guy, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, you know, gun in the right hand, maybe a note in the other hand, and, you know, give me what you got across the counter. Um, not a very sophisticated M.O. at all, and uh, certainly um, didn't have the smarts that Terry Connor had. Connor was a smooth talker, recruiting accomplices with ease. Terry was, uh, you know, primarily a West Coast guy, and uh, Terry, uh, being from the West Coast and being uh, from California, uh, we did certainly concentrate our efforts out there in California looking for him. Agents contacted the Monterey, California FBI resident agency. They told Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer what they knew about Terry Connor. Oklahoma City went on to tell us that uh, the suspicion was that he had a girlfriend that lived in Pacific Grove, California, and they wondered if he might not be heading in that direction and asked us to do some work to see if we could work that angle. They located Connor's girlfriend's home. Routine surveillance revealed a possible link to Terry Connor, who was last believed to be in Oklahoma City. While doing a spot check on this residence, lo and behold, there was a vehicle parked out front with Oklahoma license plates on it. So I notified the Oklahoma City office, and uh, they didn't actually have a record of that vehicle that they could positively tie into Terry Connor at the time, but they thought it might have been one that he purchased under an alias. I'll tell you what, you ever seen... The While the girlfriend was away from the house, agents spoke with her gardener. Identifying themselves, they told him they were conducting a federal investigation. He needed to be truthful and discreet. They asked if he had recently seen any men at the residence. He hadn't, but recalled overhearing the girlfriend talking about meeting Connor the following week. The information I got was specific enough that we knew that on a given day, Terry Connor was going to meet somewhere with his girlfriend. And so I felt at that point in time that we were very close to Terry Connor. Agents followed Connor's girlfriend for days, learning that she drove several different cars. They placed tracking devices on each of them, with receivers in FBI cars and airplanes. They tracked her whenever she drove. But on the day she was to meet Connor, the signal faded. Once we lost the vehicle, uh, we were. Uh spreading our vehicles out in all sorts of directions trying to locate the signal. And we had an airplane assisting us that day and the airplane uh, uh, gave us the signal out on the highway and uh, we picked her up again. Agents traveled toward the location of the recaptured signal. When they spotted the car, it was parked in front of a restaurant. There was no sign of the girlfriend or Terry Connor or anybody else that was associated with the car, so we uh, made a plan right then to establish full-time coverage on the car until something happened. Roger, stand down. 
Alright guys, we're still in stand down mode. Stand down. A SWAT team waited, watching for any sign of the suspect. An FBI agent made sure that if the couple returned for the car, they couldn't drive it away. We let the air out of her tires so they wouldn't sneak in and sneak out real fast and waited. Most stakeouts mean long hours with no payoff. But the agents had to stick with it and hope that suspected Ten bank robber system. Terry Connor would surface. After a hostage taking and bank robbery in Oklahoma City, the FBI developed two suspects, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty. Two months later, and 1,500 miles away in Atascadero, California, agents staked out a restaurant where Connor's girlfriend had left a car. They believed Connor was in the area planning to meet her. The long hours of the stakeout paid off for FBI Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer. We just happened to see Terry Connor drive into the parking lot with his girlfriend, and uh, it doesn't usually work this way, but the photographs we had of Terry Connor were of such quality that it was easy to make instant recognition, so we knew that we were about to uh, accomplish our mission. The suspect was known to carry weapons, so a tactical arrest team took the lead. Hey, hey. FBI, FBI. They struck fast, giving Terry Connor no opportunity to flee. The girlfriend was questioned and released after investigators determined she was not involved in Connor's crimes. Give me left hand. Agents then discovered an unexpected benefit to deflating the tire of the girlfriend's car. By the time we got to the point where we were making our arrest, he had already popped the trunk on his car. And of course, without a search warrant, we couldn't have gotten in there if he hadn't popped it for us. And so once the arrest was made, there we had in plain view the contents of his trunk, and that was useful to us because there was a briefcase that we opened and found a substantial amount of money. Nearly $40,000 in cash bore serial numbers matching some of the money stolen during the Oklahoma City robbery. Agents also found a large diamond and a jeweler's receipt for six more. Authorities took Connor to the Monterey FBI office, where they charged him with the Oklahoma City robbery. In handing over his personal effects during the intake process, something of interest emerged. A sales receipt from a Reno, Nevada car dealership. The buyer was listed as Russell Anderson, perhaps an unknown alias of Connor or Doherty. He had given an address in Santa Maria, California. My instinctive belief was that that address might well be the address of his partner, Doherty. So we put out the word as fast as we could to our counterparts, Southern California, asked them to get out and check that address. The SWAT team immediately went to the residence and prepared to make entry. They suspected Doherty was inside, perhaps armed. The bang grenade was designed to stun anyone in the house. Please, 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 please. By the time they got there, whoever had been occupying that 
address was uh, gone. I fear that possibly they were alerted by Terry Connor in, in the bookend process when he was given his uh, phone call. Word that Connor was arrested, but that Doherty was not, went out to case agent Steve Chenoweth. Even though we're looking for two, we're certainly willing to take one. And uh, the fact that we didn't find Joe there was a little disappointing, but uh, also the fact that we did find Terry Connor meant that we had solved uh, half of that equation and we just had to up the ante to find Joe. Chenoweth knew Joe Doherty would keep robbing banks using the method taught him by Connor. But without Terry Connor controlling him, Doherty was a loose cannon, now more dangerous than ever. Terry was uh, the brains. Uh, Terry was the guy that made most of the decisions. And now you're putting uh, Joe, who is more prone to violence than Terry was, uh, basically in a leadership role. If he should fly off the handle, there might not be anybody there to calm him down. For eight months, there was no sign of Doherty anywhere. Then, in Phoenix, on the night before the busiest shopping day of the year, when banks are stocked up with cash, the vice president of a large area bank returned home with his family from a Thanksgiving dinner with relatives. What happened? It appeared their home had been burglarized. But the intruders hadn't left. Through the night, the two robbers held the banker and his family hostage. We just want to rob the bank. Just calm down. It looked like Joe Doherty was leading a new partner. And now that he was in charge, Do you understand? anything could happen. Settle in and be friends. Thanksgiving, 1983. They're told no one gets hurt. Give me the keys. Two intruders held a Phoenix banker and his family hostage overnight. Go start the car. Hours before dawn, Joe Doherty and his new partner were ready to rob the bank. They would use the banker's car for transportation and his children for collateral. Doherty never put down his weapon. Remember, I've got the gun on your wife. Get in the car. In less than two hours, they would drive to the bank, empty its vault, and escape with $270,000 cash, leaving the family frightened but unharmed. What's the address? The heist was in the home city of the lead case agent okay. on Doherty's trail. OK, put it out to all agents. When Steve Chenoweth learned of the crime, he believed he knew who had done it. Thanks. My first thought right away is um, Joe Doherty, but didn't know the answer to that until I started talking to the victims to get an actual physical description. Wondering if Doherty was taunting him by striking in his own town, Chenoweth headed to the banker's home to learn more details of a fearful night spent held at gunpoint. Most of us don't go through that, and uh, to go through it for an entire evening uh, with your two children uh, is a very scary thing. And so uh, they were glad it was over, and they were certainly glad to see us come. Jack, can you tell me just a little bit more about... The banker described the assailants, saying both wore obvious wigs, and the bigger one was in charge. Once I got the information, um, the physical description of the leader uh, fit that of Joe Doherty uh, right to a T. So I knew that we were dealing with Joe, but here again, uh, we had another individual that he had picked up, and we didn't know who that guy was as his partner. Normally there. The family described how the pair had acted. Doherty and his new partner were more volatile and threatening than he and Connor had been. But as before, they left agents with no leads. One bigger guy, one bigger guy that... Six months later, 
and 900 miles to the northwest in Reno, Nevada. Local police called the FBI to another robbed bank. Once again, the heist was preceded by a hostage taking the night before. But this time, the level of violence had increased. Now, there was a bomb. They'd strapped it around the uh, bank officer, indicating that it was explosives. And if he didn't do uh, what he was told to do, that they would detonate that. And that certainly is enough to put the fear of God into you. And, and I would certainly do anything that they asked me to do. I want to stay with him. I'm right outside, Bob. Determining there were no booby traps, a Reno police bomb specialist freed the terrified bank officer and sent him out of the vault to safety. cut off the power supply, though he later determined the device was a fake. The bank officer told the FBI that he and his family had been held hostage at gunpoint overnight by two men wearing wigs and business suits. Uh, recognize the gentleman in this picture right here? That's him. That's Shown a photo of Joseph Doherty, he said it looked like one of the men. Witnesses had seen a white sedan with Washington state plates speeding away from the bank after the robbery. So agents searched the area. They found the vehicle abandoned less than 200 yards from the Reno FBI office. It seemed Doherty was again boldly challenging the FBI. A check of the plates showed it was registered to a man in Spokane, Washington. That man said he had recently sold the car to someone who fit the description of Doherty and a pregnant woman whom the FBI believed to be Doherty's girlfriend. To help find the couple, the FBI called on the U.S. Marshals, experts in interstate tracking of cars and people. United States Marshal Denny Barrand believed the cars Doherty used would be the key to finding him. As fugitives, Joseph Doherty was very smart. He changed cars like some people change socks. Uh, he would uh, buy cars, sell them, sell them back to the original owners, sell them to a used car lot. Marshalls painstakingly followed a complex trail of cars and aliases and eventually got a break. They discovered a car accident report linking one of Doherty's aliases to an address in Idaho. Hi there. Since the house appeared to be abandoned, the marshals interviewed neighbors. Yeah, this, this is One woman I mean. immediately recognized the robber, though she only knew him by his alias. Yeah. She said he had the peculiar habit of shooting pistols in his backyard. Baby. And about a week ago, though, they packed up and moved She away. told the marshals that he, his girlfriend, and their newborn child had recently moved out. OK, go ahead. Securing a subpoena for moving truck rental records in the area, okay. Marshall's determined Doherty's girlfriend had rented one under a false name right. and had driven Good. it to Colorado. Now, check that Good. The rental company right. gave authorities her destination, a house in the mountains outside Denver. FBI agents and U.S. Marshals watched from the cover of the woods surrounding the house. Because there was now a baby involved, they had to be especially cautious. At one point, they observed the girlfriend leaving the house with another man. It wasn't Doherty. The marshals could not see if they had the infant with them. All clear. All clear. 
Other marshals followed the two into town and watched them enter a store without the baby. I said, go to the car that's parked in the shopping mall parking lot and look inside and see if they left the baby inside the car. It's a negative on the kid in the car. Uh, we're gonna go check out. And they radioed back to me, no, the baby's not in the car. And they didn't have the baby in arms. That means one thing, the baby's still at the house. Still at the house with Joseph Doherty. After two years of constantly being minutes too late, authorities believed they were finally going to arrest the dangerous robber. But in law enforcement, things rarely happen exactly as planned. Two years after Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty robbed an Oklahoma City bank, Connor had been captured, convicted of armed bank robbery, and sentenced to 25 years. The FBI believed his partner, Joseph Doherty, had continued a spree of hostage taking and bank robbery, but that they finally had him cornered in a Colorado house. Earlier that day, they had arrested the fugitive's girlfriend and a male associate. The girlfriend confirmed that Doherty and their infant child were still inside the house. And that Doherty was armed. Okay, y'all got that as a small child in there? Yes, sir. Okay, do not fire except on his order. Got it. You ready? Right. Set up the front. A SWAT team fanned out in stations around the house. Copy number two. Number three, are you in position? Same thing, just moving around. Go. Also watching was U.S. Marshal Denny Berend. Joseph Doherty stepped out of the house, positively identified, and with that he took a 357 Magnum and started to fire into the woods. But it didn't look like Doherty was firing at the agents. The SWAT team had to keep cool. I just hunker down. If you're not in danger, don't return fire. Don't return fire unless you're being threatened. The marshals would call the neighbor in Idaho who had said Doherty often fired random shots in his backyard. They believed he didn't know they were there. Okay, just hold your fire. Hold your fire and let me know if he comes back out again. We're gonna try him on the phone. They still needed to resolve the situation peacefully. An FBI negotiator placed a call to the house. Hello. This is the FBI. We have you surrounded. The negotiator he said, I established contact, but the person is hung up. It was answered by a male, but he hung up. Got it. The well-trained snipers had several possible shots at the fugitive but they held off. We had to consider, of course, the safety of the baby. We had to consider the safety of other people that might be in the home that we didn't know about. They've seen him go past the window several times. They see the baby. Has anybody caught sight of the child? Anybody seen the child? Still, they had to be ready if Doherty started firing at them. Again, try to get him on the phone. Stay by and be ready. The negotiator called the house again. You don't want the child to get hurt, come out of the house. He told the fugitive that his girlfriend and accomplice had already been arrested. Come out of the house. And asked Doherty to consider his child's safety and surrender peacefully. He hung up. All right, guys, he hung up. Let's move right, in. Move to the, the front, front now. Through the window, they saw him approaching the door. Please, 
Back up on my command. Back up now. Back up. Come on. Hands up. Come on. On the ground. Now. All the way. Flat down. Arms out. All the way down. Copy. He was arrested without a struggle. Once we had the baby out of the house, we had the house secured, then we began to move through it. And we discovered 16 firearms in that house, including a 308 tactical assault rifle, two of those, um, all hidden, all loaded, all charged and ready to go to defend that house. Doherty was charged and held for trial in Oklahoma. Almost a year and a half later, on June 19th, 1985, Two U.S. Marshals were transporting Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty to an Oklahoma City courthouse. Oh, my guess, sure. Doherty was facing the first of four trials, this one for the bank robbery and hostage taking in Oklahoma City three years earlier. Not he had subpoenaed thing, his partner, all. Terry Connor, as a witness. I don't know what to do with <laughs> On a rural road, they made their move with smuggled jailhouse contraband a handcuff key and a razor blade. They had never planned on arriving at the courthouse. They took the marshal's guns. Pull over. And ordered them off the road. Yeah. Okay. They marched the lawman into the woods. The felons were desperate for freedom, and it seemed no one could stop them from gaining it. June 19th, 1985. Bank robbers Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty escaped the custody of two U.S. Marshals while in transit to Doherty's trial. The fugitives handcuffed the marshals to a tree and stole their weapons, badges, and car. They were mobile, armed, and for now, no one knew they were back on the run. They had a 15-minute head start before the marshals managed to free themselves and report the escape. At the U.S. courthouse in Oklahoma City, Special Agent Steve Chenoweth was shocked when he heard the news. My initial thought was, uh, this can't happen. When you put so much time and effort into uh, a case like this over a period of years, and to have it just kind of disappear in a flash, in a moment's notice, um, it's a real severe letdown. Bank surveillance videos captured Connor and Doherty's next crimes. Two small-scale bank robberies in St. Louis. Agents believe they'd needed some quick cash before getting back to their regular routine. Initially, after the escape and after the fact that they had held up both banks there in, um, in St. Louis, and had about $30,000 cash. We knew that they were gonna be coming back out and striking again at a uh, bank, at a bank officer and his family. We knew that there was a potential, a high potential for kidnapping. Uh, we knew that the, uh, the uh, propensity for violence was great. Two months later, police in West Allis, Wisconsin, received a bank robbery call. This is Sherry, can I help you? You're at what bank? Any address, please? A half million dollars was taken, the largest bank heist in the state's history. Station to squad 113, you're responding to a bank robbery, 10707 West National Avenue. 
It was by now an all too familiar pattern. Two gunmen had held the bank president and his wife hostage, then, again aided by a lookout, robbed the bank. Fingerprints placed Connor and Doherty at the scene. Local police called the Wisconsin FBI. Special Agent Dan Kraft was assigned the case. Reading witness statements, he saw that the fugitives were bolder than ever, no longer even using disguises. They did nothing to conceal their identity. They didn't do anything to really help by saying their names, but he, uh, Terry Connor did mention to the bank president's wife, he said, uh, the FBI is going to know who we are. Because of the continuing danger Connor and Doherty posed, both were placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Media coverage drew many leads. Use your help on it. One call led agents to a man that. who might have been the robber's lookout outside the Wisconsin the bank. Agents issued an APB for the alleged lookout's car. Days later, a state trooper pulled him over and called the FBI. Um, what got going on here? Once they identified him, they took him in. There was an active open warrant for him f out of uh, St. Louis for violating his federal parole. So we arrested him and I uh, brought him downtown to the FBI office. At first, the man refused to answer questions about Connor and Doherty. So we would talk, and this went on for five days. But it wasn't a sweating. I mean, you see on television where it looks like an interrogation and you're getting in somebody's face. No, it was just two men talking. Finally, Kraft won him over. Thinking about it. But he was afraid of facing Connor and Doherty yeah. in court. Let's talk about let's just talk about it, you know, and uh... I'd like to cooperate, he says, but you know, I won't testify. So you don't have to testify. We don't need your testimony. You know, we've got these guys locked in. I just need to know how they think. I need to know what they do and how they do it so I can get one step ahead of them. And what they're doing. The suspect agreed to talk in the hopes of a reduced sentence. He told Kraft how Connor and Doherty chose the banks they robbed, how they traveled, even how they communicated through hotel front desks. One of them would call up and make a reservation in the name of a former prison warden. And the other one would call up and ask if this person had checked in yet. And uh, the switchboard operator would then say, no, uh, Mr. So-and-so hadn't checked in yet. And then they'd say, well, can I leave a message for him? So then the other one would then call back looking for messages. And they did this as one of their ways of uh, communicating without ever it being traced. The most important piece of information he gave was the name of another man who had helped Connor and Doherty rob banks in the past. His name was John Harris. Agents found Harris in Tucson, Arizona. Surveilling him, they saw him making and receiving calls at a certain payphone. Getting a warrant, they tapped the phone and listened in. He was talking to Connor and Doherty. We hoped through a series of wiretaps that we might be able to uh, trace the phone back to a particular area and through investigation in that area, maybe locate them. Agents learned the fugitives were calling from Chicago and were planning another robbery there. Special Agent George Spinelli of the FBI Chicago field office distributed photos of the fugitives to area hotels. One reported a guest who looked like Joseph Doherty, though that name wasn't on the register. As I looked at the register, I looked down and I did see an alias that Connor had used in the past. At that point, I thought possibly we had two top ten fugitives at this hotel. Case agent Steve Chenoweth immediately flew to Chicago, joining the other agents at the hotel. The guest who looked like Doherty appeared to have checked out. How about a vehicle? No, no vehicles yet either. 
agents watched the room Connor might be in. If he was there, they needed to confront him outside his room to avoid a standoff. We were very concerned that it could get violent, and uh, especially Connor, who had vowed that he would never be taken alive. We took uh, extra precautions at that point. An arrest team planned the takedown for the parking lot. Okay. All right, keep an eye. Okay, sounds good. Eventually, the FBI agent spotted someone leaving the room. I think I might have something here. Come here, take, take a, a look. look. Yeah, got some activity. Can't see his face yet. It was Connor. That's him, George. That's Connor. He was That's alone. Tony, it's our guy. Take him. Take him now. Agents called for the SWAT team to make the arrest. So he did not have an opportunity to uh, to get away. He was grabbed immediately. Although Joe Dockerty was not seen by agents, it appeared he was nearby and saw the police activity. A call came in to um, the switchboard asking what was going on. And it was a male and asking about uh, you know, the occupant maybe of a particular room. And uh, no doubt in my mind it was Doherty. And he was trying to find out what happened. Agents searched the area but did not find Doherty. The one thing they knew was that he would commit more robberies with a new partner. This guy doesn't have any other choice. He can't do a robbery by himself. He's got to reach out for somebody else. The FBI believed he'd call on John Harris and learned Harris had recently flown to San Francisco. Again, they spotted Harris repeatedly using a certain payphone. They ordered another phone tap. About a week later, uh, we get a phone call, and it was uh, Joe Doherty. Doherty said he was calling from St. Louis. But FBI technicians couldn't trace the call out of San Francisco. And all of a sudden, the stark realization came to us that this guy's not in, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, Doherty is, is right there in that area. Agents realized he himself was surveilling his lookout to see if he had been followed. They hoped he hadn't seen the undercover agents. All right. All right, later. Believing his lookout was in the clear, Doherty planned a meeting for the next morning there in San Francisco. Agents showed up early. Doherty arrived as promised. And at about that time, we had a whole lot of very Weary FBI agents pounce on Joseph William Doherty. And so ends the, uh, the saga, and so ended the chase. After a nationwide manhunt that lasted more than a year, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty were tried for their most recent crimes. They each received two life sentences, plus 139 years without parole. They are kept in separate federal prisons. Their partnership forever terminated.